Guys, Jim Cramer is very excited about McCormick and Company. They're the makers of the Frank's Red Hot Sauce, the Cholua brand, and the French's ketchup that you can see in the back here. And he's excited with the name, even despite the company reaching its 52 week high on what I would describe as a high multiple for the name. Now he brought in the CEO on his show after the Q4 results to discuss the business. Now look, I absolutely agree. I put Frank's hot sauce on absolutely everything, but after looking at the valuation, I'm not so sure that I'd put it in my portfolio. So smash that like button and subscribe if you're new because that's exactly what we're gonna be covering in this video. You're watching more money, let's get it. All right, guys, if you haven't heard of McCormick and Company, they are the makers of Frank Red Hot Sauce. And they also have other brands that you may be aware of under their umbrella, including French's, which is the only ketchup brand my wife allows us to buy. Heinz is way better, but this is an issue that causes pandemonium in our marriage. They also own Billy B's Honey brand, and one of their newest acquisitions, which they are very proud of, is Cholua's Hot Sauce. I always see that in the grocery store, but I've never tried it until now. I think it's really good. So overall, you can see that they're a consumer product Products company mostly in the area of condiments of ketchup and hot sauce. They have also been growing through acquisitions and they seem to have a competitive advantage because when they bring the brand onto their platform they're able to expand that brand. And here's your CEO discussing just that on Jim Cramer's show Mad Money. This you bought Cholula which was a little bit sleepier than I like kind of like a private equity thing and you've turned it on fire number two. Tell us about what happens when McCormick gets a hold of a brand. Well you know Jim uh First of all, I, I, again, uh, thank you for having me on. And, and we did just report a terrific uh, quarter. A consumer demand for flavor is just so strong. And our acquisition of Cholula Hot Sauce, uh, and, and we also bought uh, uh, Phone of Flavors last year, really did make fantastic additions to our uh, portfolio. You know, with uh, Cholula, we have expanded distribution. We've gotten it shelved better. Um, you know, we have uh, propelled uh, Cholula's growth. It was already a strong brand. Uh, but we have propelled it to the number two position in the hot sauce category in the U.S. You know, uh, Cholula and Frank's are like uh, brother and sister uh, in the in the hot sauce category now. Uh, Frank's number one, Cholula number two. And I don't want to leave out restaurants. We have added thousands of uh, of restaurants, uh, uh, front of house uh, usage and back of house. And, uh, and and I guess I'll tell you one more uh, thing about Cholula is that uh, we added over a million households uh, using Cholula uh, in the last year. So really, really great progress on that brand. So they're able to increase the product's grocery store reach, which is really amazing. And you can see how they have a huge runway of amazing hot sauces and other condiment type brands that they can acquire and bring to the masses. Personally, I think there's a ton of opportunity in the hot salsa space and the hot ketchup space and the hot international food space. The offerings, especially in that last category right now, are very weak. This guy right here is a personal favorite of mine that's only available in one grocery store here in Toronto. So they definitely have some good runway here as they continue to expand their portfolio through acquisitions. And if I'm gonna be honest, guys, this might be the real reason why they have such a high multiple, which I'll dive into into more detail later in this video. Now, further into the interview, Kramer touches on a very important point with his next question as it relates to the potential change in the post lockdown consumer behavior, which actually changes the way that I think we should all be thinking about lockdown and reopening place. They assume a specific type of consumer behavior, which may no longer be accurate. Here's Kramer on that point. You know, one of the things that uh, people had told me was, look, when we get the reopening, uh, it's not it's, what you're going to have is people going to go back. They're not going to be cooking. Uh, they'll go back to going to restaurants. And I always said, well, listen, they'll get... Pfft. Uh, but Corbin will get them in restaurants, will get them at home. But what I am surprised about is the robust nature of people cooking at home, even after they're allowed to go out. Something's really going on here, Lawrence. It's very different from the way it's been in a long time. You know, it's been too, too much has been attributed to the pandemic. There has been a long term trend towards cooking at home, uh, cooking from scratch at home, uh, cooking more healthily at home really driven by younger consumers. And Jim, I know you've got uh, young members of your family. Um, you know, they all, you, you know, I'm sure you see it uh, as an anecdote. They all take pictures of everything that they cook and pass it around. I mean, cooking has been uh, in fashion uh, among young consumers for a long time. And it's really a long-term trend that we see globally. The well, pandemic accelerated it, but, but, but it was a trend already before the pandemic. It's been a trend through the pandemic and we believe it's 
continuing for the long term. So, I mean, his rationale of young people wanting to cook at home to take pictures and share it with their friends, I guess that's one explanation. The other explanation could be that young people want to go out, but can't really afford it with their levels of student debt, high cost of living, and low entry wages. But what do I know about young people? The more important takeaway from here is that it shows that with the secular change in consumer patterns to more stay-at-home eating behaviors, the company is resilient and expected to continue to win with the customer. So in other words, whether you go out or stay at home, they have an option for you. And that's a real plus for the brand overall, in my opinion. As I was modeling this company out, I was having trouble thinking about inflation and how it could impact margins. And what I found helpful is that Kramer just flat out asked the CEO about that. And here was the question. Most companies in your business have had a hard time with inflation. When I looked at the, your brands and what I see, I think some companies don't, I can, can pass it on because their brands are so great. You did not spend a lot of time on inflation. And that, to me, says that you can take price. Well, you know, um, inflation is certainly out there. And, and it's going to come through. It, I mean, it came through in our, in our numbers for, uh, for last year. And, and, it's, and it's part of our outlook for, for next year. You know, I think that you know, the first, you know, we don't give quarterly guidance. But, but if I, I were, I'd say, you know, first quarter is going to be a tough comparison to last year because all the pricing isn't going to be in, in, in effect and all the cost is in effect. Um, you, know, you know, we do see uh, inflation. Uh, we are taking pricing to, uh, to to counter. You know, our brands are strong. We're the leader in our categories, and our customers and our consumers know that we're going to be fair. Um, you, know, you know, we're passing through costs. We're not margining up. Um, and 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 honestly, Jim, our products are part of the consumer solution for right. grocery bill inflation, not part of the problem. You know, you know, when things like meat go up forty percent. Uh, consumers can use McCormick flavors, uh, Frank's hot sauce, to to get all the flavor that they want out of their meal, uh, while they while they may buy cheaper cuts of meat and use more vegetables. I That's mean, a it, great point. With flank, right, flank steak doubled, right? But and so a way to be able to make it different and better is with your stuff. Really good story. So honestly, I thank him for his answer, but I'm not so convinced of his argument. In an inflationary environment where my grocery bill is being pinched, of course I won't be buying expensive cuts of meat, but I think I'd also be avoiding expensive condiments as well since I'm already being stretched on my grocery bill. Hot sauce is something that I think is really easy to cut out of a grocery purchase, as you can use cheaper forms of spice such as fresh hot peppers, chili flakes, or hot pepper powders. So I don't know, I think they can see top line decline if inflation gets really bad. And I think they can also see some decline as consumers are pinched with a potential of four rate hikes in 2022. I don't have a crystal ball, of course, but you guys tell me what you think in the comments below. What I thought was weird in this interview was that Kramer didn't mention the valuation of McCormick either before or after the interview. And I think partially that is because he needs to be positive on the name to maintain a relationship with the CEO and continue to have him on the show. But if we quickly look at the valuation, you can see that the company is trading at 35 times earnings. Now, should it be trading at such a high multiple? I mean, I guess if they're expected to increase earnings at high rates, but I'm not really seeing it. They have told us to expect revenue growth in the three to 5% range and EPS in the $3.07 to $3.11 area, which does reflect a 17% growth year over year, but I wouldn't get too excited. That's because the increase in EPS is not really coming from top line growth. Instead, it's coming from an expected reversion in profitability because as you can see here, their operating profit margins are impacted in 2021, both from higher costs of goods and higher SG&A costs. Now, they don't seem to have very many levers to pull because you can see that their COGS, although did tick lower in 2021, they're still largely in line with historical averages of 40%. So the only place where you can increase profitability is from reducing SG&A as a percentage of revenue, which I have to say isn't easy. I much rather get it from COGS as a cost increase pass through to the customer. So, okay, I can accept that they hit their EPS guidance of 2022. And then what we're left with is a specialty consumer products company growing top line revenue somewhere around that 5% a year range if they are not impacted with a consumer slowdown, which I would argue could hit them in harder than it would Kraft or Procter & Gamble. Can I put a 30 times multiple on this? I don't think so. At best, they'd get a 20 times multiple from me, which makes it closer to a $60 per share stock that's currently trading at almost $100. And, and honestly, I really think I'm missing something here. And I would love for you guys to chime in here. Why should we be paying more than 30 times earnings 
as it is value today for this company. Also guys, I'm coming out with some really important videos, including really killer opportunities that I'm seeing out there right now in the bloodbath that is the tech stock. So to make sure that you don't miss out on any of those videos, please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell to be notified when those videos come out. Also, this isn't the first time that I've discussed Jim Cramer on this channel. Check out this video here I did where I covered the time where Jim Cramer said that Charlie Munger was wrong on his Alibaba investment.